The Fast and the Furious 8, or The Fate of the Furious, as it's known in America. Let's talk about this movie while I play some CSR racing in the background. That game seems appropriate to this franchise. The Fast and Furious films are frothy, unapologetic, popcorn, guilty pleasure action movies and pure escapism. The fact that they unashamedly aim to provide nothing but ridiculous, high-octane entertainment is something you have to be aware of going in. Your expectations have to be set accordingly, and there's a market for films like this, a big one, as evidenced by its box office return. Spoilers ahead, of course. There's not much to analyze in a story this simple, so I'll make this summary rather brief. This film picks up sometime after the previous installment, with Dominic Toretto and Letty celebrating their honeymoon in Cuba. There's the requisite street race to placate the long-time petrol heads from when the franchise was still a street racer series. Long story short, a character called Cypher is introduced, played by Charlize Theron. Basically, in this film, Dom is encouraged to work with her and betray his team because he's being blackmailed. Cypher has Dom's ex-girlfriend, Elena, held captive, including their son. Yes, Dom is actually a father. Elena was, of course, introduced in the fifth film in the franchise and featured prominently in that film and the sixth and very briefly in the last film. Dom's team is tasked with bringing Dom in and preventing a nuclear weapon falling into the wrong hands. They're led by The Rock's Luke Hobbs and directed by Kurt Russell's Mr. Nobody and this time joined by new recruit Little Nobody, played by Scott Eastwood. In addition, Jason Statham's Deckard Shaw, yes, the villain from the previous film, is now a member of the team. He and Hobbs have some humorous macho sparring and choice words until, of course, they start to bond. It's extraordinary. It's a fundamental logical and narrative inconsistency here because it's as if the writers have forgotten or decided to rewrite history. Deckard Shaw was a vicious, cold-blooded killer who murdered their friend Han in the previous film, or technically at the end of the sixth film, or at the end of the third film, depending on whether you've been keeping up with the rather complex timeline and continuity of the series. Whatever, regardless, this guy is not some honorable thief or lovable rogue. He murdered one of their quote-unquote family, and Dom swore bloody vengeance. They beat the snot out of each other at the end of the last film, and now he becomes a trusted member of the team with Dom, even at one point of the film, trusting Shaw to rescue his son from Cypher's plane. Which is actually a hilarious scene in the movie, but anyway. As an added twist, Deckard is joined by the villain from the sixth film, his brother Owen. I mean, this is insane. The franchise keeps doing this. The theme of making one's enemy their friend. Hobbs was added to the team, having been a villain of sorts in the fifth film. Now Shaw? Is there ever going to be any justice for Han at all? This narrative lapse creates a, a core flaw in the film and with the integrity of the characters, basically. It also undermines the previous film. And what's next? Is Cypher going to become a member of Dom's family next? She's an absolute psychopath, and I will say very well played by Theron. She's without doubt the franchise's best villain to date. Very menacing. Now, some people are just not redeemable, and I really hope that the franchise doesn't try to incorporate her into the Fast family. Every time Dom does this, he just seems more naive than enlightened. The film offers the usual colorful variety in locations and action set pieces, with some breathtaking visuals in New York City, including some autonomous vehicles that Cypher hacks and takes control of. They become kind of like zombie cars. It's actually alarming to see this because I've read about how it will no doubt be possible one day for hackers to take control of driverless cars and create spam jams. Something like what's depicted in this film is not beyond the bounds of possibility as a means of cyber terrorism. The film wraps up with a final sequence in Russia in another visual departure, this time on the ice. It's truly over the top. Great CGI, but completely ridiculous. A submarine chasing cars and tanks, and one of the cars is Roman's orange Lamborghini. It's just total lunacy. The film is left open for a sequel, and the bad guy gets away this time. Dom ends up a father, and we fade to black. 
Throughout the film, I found myself missing the presence of the late Paul Walker and the character of Brian. He's mentioned briefly, incidentally, and I really think the series is severely compromised following his passing. I like the characters, though. They're endearing, and the interplay and banter is lighthearted and fun to watch. The tone never gets too serious, and generally the film is an enjoyable romp. That being said, the dialogue is absolutely atrocious in some places, cringe-inducing to the point of being like something a child wrote, and what makes it worse is that the cringiest lines are reserved for the more serious moments. The film just seems like it's lacking a few gears, perhaps a genuinely meaningful story beyond Dom's superficial emphasis on family, which is just kind of becoming tiresome at this point. With the filmmakers continuously trying to top the spectacle and action scenes of the previous films, I find myself becoming numb to them after a while, and the bigger they get, the less I care. The film just feels like a big-budget Steven Seagal B-movie, with more explosions and more elaborate set pieces and effects. The move to a more spy-caper-type genre has turned the franchise into a lightweight imitation of superior Hollywood spy movies. It just doesn't feel like an authentic switch. Personally, I think that the Fast and Furious franchise probably should have ended with the previous film, which was also a poignant and moving send-off for Paul Walker. Given his involvement in the series from the beginning, with him gone, it just feels like it's time to end this thing. It's just not the same without him, and the character of Dom loses a certain quality that wants to find him. His friendship with Brian and their long and complicated backstory. That dynamic is lost, and so is a certain chemistry and magic to the series. Of course, there's still a big demand for these movies, and the massive box office receipts for this one prove that I'm in the minority here. There's still some gas left in the tank, but I'm personally skeptical that the quality can be maintained for two final installments. This one really isn't worth seeing in the cinema, to be honest. It's more of a DVD affair.